Next, and we'll start with the chair and commissioner of our New York City uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, Carmelin Malalas. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, and uh, good afternoon to all of you over there. Uh, I'm Carmelin P. Malalas, and I am the chair and commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. I want to, of course, thank, first of all, uh, California State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and your staff for inviting me to speak about sexual harassment in our standard in New York City. Uh, I'm honored to testify today before the California Senate Judiciary Committee and the Select Committee on Women, Work, and Families at this joint informational hearing re-examining the legal standard for sexual harassment in the state of California. Uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio appointed me in November 2014, and I assumed my role as chair and commissioner in February of 2015. Uh, and I know that there's great variation in how different state and local human rights agencies are structured, how they function, and in their mandates. So allow me to first provide a brief background on our agency and the law that we enforce. The New York City Commission on Human Rights is the New York City government agency responsible for enforcing New York City's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws called the New York City Human Rights Law. The law includes 24 categories of protection most of which protect against discrimination and harassment in practically all areas of city living. So employment, housing, uh, places of public accommodation, uh, harassment on the streets, in transit, in other spaces. And the construction provision of our law requires that it be construed liberally for the accomplishment of the uniquely broad and remedial purposes thereof. In 2005, the New York City uh, uh, Council and the government passed the Restoration Act in response to court decisions that conflated the New York City human rights law with state and federal anti-discrimination laws. The Restoration Act clarifies that our law must be interpreted more broadly than its state and federal counterparts. So by statute, the commission serves two main functions. The first is as a civil law enforcement agency, which is why the commission has a law enforcement bureau that takes in complaints of discrimination from the public, initiates its own investigations on behalf of the city, and utilizes its in-house testing program to help identify entities breaking the law. Agency filed actions in which the Law Enforcement Bureau determines that there is probable cause to believe that a person or entity has engaged in an unlawful discriminatory act are prosecuted by the Law Enforcement Bureau before administrative law judges in a different city agency. And then those ALJs provide reports and recommendations on liability, damages, and penalties to my office within the commission, the office of the chair, which then looks at the case de novo and issues a final decision and order that is reviewable in New York State Court. The second main function of the commission is to perform community outreach and provide education on the New York City human rights law and human rights related issues, which is why the commission also has a community relations bureau that's comprised of community service centers in each of the city's five boroughs. Now turning to this issue at hand. While sexual harassment in the workplace is not a new phenomenon, we are of course nationally experiencing a reckoning on this issue with regards to this all too common human rights abuse. And deep thanks are owed to the women, the men, and the non-binary people who have been bravely coming forward at much personal and professional risk to share their stories of sexual harassment and assault across industries. The wave of people breaking their silence has been steady and it has been unrelenting. And it is my hope that our collective work uh, in government, as lawmakers, as folks in the public who have an interest in ridding sexual harassment from the workplace, will provide even more voices to be heard and even more stories to be surfaced. The power structures that have existed for so long to allow this behavior to persist for, in some cases, decades, as we hear, to silence victims, to shame victims, and to make victims believe they are powerless, are crumbling around us. And sexual harassment is being exposed for exactly what it is, an abuse of power and an abuse of privilege. And it is being exposed in many of these instances with women leading the way. While the entertainment industry dominates the headlines, we know that low-wage workers and immigrant workers, domestic workers, LGBTQ workers, and workers of color experience sexual harassment at extremely high rates. 
and their unique and intersecting vulnerabilities make it even harder for them to assert their rights, protect themselves, and demand justice. Just last month, the New York City Commission on Human Rights held a citywide public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace. We invited testimony from representatives coming from a diversity of industries, from workers' rights advocates and government officials to testify about what New York City and the Commission specifically could do differently or do better to combat sexual harassment. We will be publishing a report this spring that will include our findings and recommendations from the hearing, and we'll be happy to share it, of course, with the lawmakers here as well. Now, turning to the sexual harassment standard under the New York City Human Rights Law, consistent with the mandates of our statute, protections against sexual harassment, like protections in other areas of the law, are construed to provide broad remedial protection. Sexual harassment is considered a form of gender discrimination under the city rights law, which is defined as discrimination against such person on the basis of gender in compensation or in terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. In 2009, a New York State Appellate Division case introduced a legal standard for what constitutes sexual harassment under the city human rights law that has been followed by New York State and federal courts in New York in interpreting the law. That standard has been codified into the actual statute in 2016 as part of a second restoration act. The case is Williams v. New York City Housing Authority, in which the appellate court rejected the standard of severe or pervasive and determined that sexual harassment exists when an individual is, quote, treated less well than other employees because of gender, end quote, but requires more than, quote, petty slights or trivial inconveniences, end quote. The court in Williams further stated that even a single comment that objectifies women made in circumstances where that comment would, for example, signal views about the role of women in the workplace may be actionable. And under the standard, if a plaintiff is able to establish that she was treated less well based in part on her gender, defendants may assert as an affirmative defense that the conduct complained of consists of nothing more than what a reasonable victim of discrimination would consider petty slights and trivial inconveniences. Now, this standard stands in sharp contrast with the federal standard, which I know the, the panel has heard about uh, earlier today, which the Supreme Court articulated in 1986 in Meritor Savings Bank v. Vincent where they said for sexual harassment to be actionable, it must be sufficiently severe or pervasive to alter the conditions of the victim's employment and create an abusive working environment. Now, important to note that that case involved allegations of rape, roping, and indecent exposure. The Supreme Court affirmed the standard in 1993 in Harris v. Forklift Systems and further elaborated that conduct that is not severe or pervasive enough to create an objectively hostile or abusive work environment, an environment that a reasonable person would find hostile or abusive, is beyond Title VII's purview. And I will say that many courts have found that isolated acts, unless very serious, do not meet the threshold of severity or pervasiveness. The fact that severe or pervasive that standard was born out of a case involving allegations of rape, groping, and indecent exposure sets an incredibly high factual bar. Courts ask, and we ask, what is severe or pervasive when it is behavior that does not involve physical or sexual assault? Case law that has developed around the standard varies, and courts have routinely dismissed cases for plaintiffs alleged unwanted sexual overtures or touching propositions and other behavior as not reaching the level of severe or pervasive. I understand that Patricia Bargo has testified earlier regarding the sexual harassment that she experienced. And unfortunately, I think her case is illustrative of the significant limitations of the severe or pervasive standard. Now that case, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision is cited as Brooks v. San Mateo uh, Police Department. And as Ms. Vargo so courageously described, the behavior at issue is pretty horrifying and certainly not something that I hope most people would consider to be appropriate workplace behavior. And I wish I could say that this case is an outlier, 
but it relied on well-established precedent that one or two incidents of, quote, sexual horseplay, uh, kissing, groping, and rubbing at, uh, an erection on another person does not meet severity under Title VII standard. I understand that there has been discussion as to whether the question is about changing the standard or making it, uh, making sure that it's correctly applied. But the reality is that our system of jurisprudence is based on precedent, which means that if other courts with precedential authority have misapplied the law, that misapplication, that becomes the law of the land. So how has New York City's most gener more generous standard played out in sexual harassment cases? One of the best examples we can point to is a federal Second Circuit case. In that case, the court vacated a finding of summary judgment for an employer because the court applied the federal severe or pervasive standard to the employee's city human rights law sexual harassment claims, rather than applying the city Williams standard. In this case, Mahalik v. Credit Agricole, the employee alleged that the CEO of the bank, who was also the plaintiff's supervisor, regularly inquired about her relationship status, often commented on her appearance, asked her about whether she enjoyed a particular sexual position, showed her pornography on his computer, and propositioned her multiple times. Her allegations that this type of behavior was generally accepted at the bank and that male employees regularly talked about visiting strip clubs and rated their female colleagues' appearances. However, the lower court dismissed that case. And on appeal, the Second Circuit correctly applied the Williams New York City Human Rights Law standard, finding that a jury reasonably find that the plaintiff was treated less well because of her gender and that the conduct complained of was neither petty nor trivial. The Second Circuit concluded that the sexually charged conduct, including unwanted sexual attention and two sexual propositions, subjected the plaintiff to a different set of employment conditions than her male colleagues. And also, recent sexual harassment cases at the New York City Commission on Human Rights are also illustrative. And two settlements particularly, I think, illustrate the application of the Williams standard, the city law standard, to real-life scenarios that might not meet the, the severe or pervasive standard under federal law. So in one case involving a worker at a national fast food chain, the commission found probable cause where the worker's manager rubbed her shoulders and asked her uh, uh, at once uh, in the moment and then again after the fact in very sexually explicit terms if she was aroused, if she was turned on. The commission found that the massage and the comments were sufficient to demonstrate sexual harassment under the New York City Human Rights Law and settled the case for $10,000 in damages for emotional distress to the complainant. In another recent case, a city employee alleged that a supervisor made unwanted comments of a sexual nature towards her and on one other occasion grabbed his crotch while staring at her and while they were alone in the office. Again, the commission found probable cause in that case that sexual harassment had occurred and settled the case for damages for emotional distress to the complainant. In practical terms, I believe that the New York City human rights law standard generally seems in line with current expectations of appropriate workplace behavior. I would argue that the federal standard established in 1986, and which is now over 30 years old, has not been interpreted in ways that have kept pace with our expectations of equality and respect and dignity in the workplace. Indeed, the commission's law enforcement bureau reports that parties generally assume the city human rights law standard is appropriate, and disputes typically focus on factual allegations rather than relitigating the standard under the city law as set forth in Williams. The commission is not aware of courts or parties that have critiqued that standard as imposing unfair burdens or standards on employers that is not part of their briefings. And in 2016, when we held hearings to codify the treated less well standard into our statute, no one, not one person testified objecting to it. And I can say that in the last two years, sexual harassment claims at the commission have increased by about 50%. Uh, I, again, truly appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, and I hope that you have found uh, my testimony informative and what we do here in New York City to be informative. Uh, are you finding your program to be effective? Has it been effective in replacing the severe 
um, um, and persistent standard. Uh, well, you, you know, it's interesting, as I was saying earlier, uh, the New York City Commission on Human Rights has kind of this dual structure. There's a law enforcement uh, side to it, and there's a community outreach side. And I think, you know, as in the law enforcement realm, if you're government law enforcement, I think you want to see that people are following. You want people to feel that the venue is credible, that cases that you know uh, are happening. And do we know that sexual harassment is in, uh, occurring in workplaces? Of course we do. And I think what we're finding more recently is validation of that. So the fact that we do have, uh, you know, filing up by, you know, almost 50 percent, I think, in the last two years from a law enforcement perspective is a good sign. On the community outreach side of the commission, I'm also happy to say that we are having more people reaching out for trainings and workshops and information on what their rights are uh, in New York City. Uh, you know, I mentioned that in December we held a citywide public hearing on workplace sexual harassment. And we, you know, that hearing was actually put together uh, fairly quickly. And the speed with which we put it together was in part prompted by the fact that we were receiving so many queries from city employers and businesses, folks who have obligations under our law, reaching out to say, you know what, we don't want to be a part of Me Too. We want to know what the best practices are. We want, we want guidance on how we should be handling situations. Uh, and, you know, the diversity of New York City, uh, you know, like, like in L.A., uh, means that there are a variety of different industries. And what a fix for one industry doesn't mean that that same fix works for another industry. So, in part, one of the reasons we wanted to uh, so quickly put together this hearing was so that we could then gather the testimony and then release you know, our findings from the, the, the folks who have shared their stories or from the testimony or from the advocates uh, that have represented folks in these situations. And we'll be releasing that report uh, in the spring, uh, hopefully also including guidance that in some cases will be industry specific. Thank you. Uh, I have one other question that I'm going to open it to questions um, before we close. Um, you know, one of the things <clears throat> that is of concern, we've heard some, heard some blowback, if you will, that, you know, if we reduce the standards now, we're going to end up with uh, a backlash so that people won't go have lunch with anyone other than their wives or that they, don't, they won't hire women. We've already heard that up in Sacramento here um, because it's too troublesome. We don't want the allegations. We want to avoid any um, complaints about sexual harassment creating us uh, or bringing us per potentially to the horrific dystopia of The Handmaid's Tale. Um, people ostracizing women, if you will, in the name of protecting them uh, from badly behaving men. So I wonder, have you observed any kind of backlash like this in New York? There has certainly been no reported backlash of that kind since the standard was introduced in 2009. Uh, and in 2016, since it's been actually codified into our statute, there similarly has been no reported decline in, uh, in industry or in employers hiring women uh, because of this. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Senator Morlock. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you kind of touched on what I was concerned about, and that is the overreaction or the pendulum that just goes so far to the other side. So uh, we're finding in our society that words have, sometimes have multiple meanings. And so sometimes you'll say something and someone will go, oh my goodness, what did, you, did you mean what? And you go, no, I didn't, didn't mean that at all. So I, I'm wondering, uh, instead of a complaint or something in your file, if there's a warning or if there's, there's even someone mature that says, hey, I, we heard this, can we just give you a little tip, maybe you ought to change this or is that, and you go, yeah, thanks, I, someone mature helping me out, that, that, is there, a, is there like something in between? You know, in my experience as commissioner of this agency and then, you know, just pulling from my background as someone who used to litigate these types of matters uh, when I was in a, a, a lawyer doing employment related cases for over a decade, I will tell you that those are not the types of cases that are generally litigated. It, it is not the cases where it is, you know, on the line as to whether or not something uh, could be considered uh, objectionable uh, or, or sexualized by the reasonable person. Those, those are generally not the cases that are litigated. Uh, 
Uh, that's one point I'd make. The other point I'd say is that, you know, and if, if there were businesses or industries that stopped saying, you know, who started saying we're not going to hire women anymore because we're scared that people can't act professionally in the workplace as they should, well, I, I will tell you in New York City, that would also be considered a violation of the law. If they did not hire uh, qualified women for jobs because they are women, we would certainly also consider that to be a violation of our city human rights law. All right. Thank you, folks, so much. Thank you, New York City, for your leadership in this area. And, and I think uh, you've provided us with some very uh, thoughtful uh, and insightful options that I suspect we will be considering as we try to address this very, very uh, troubling and pervasive problem 